Great. Well, thank you, Owen. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to follow on Francis to really help set a context and a little more detail um, for this uh, remarkable three-day meeting. Um, I, I would point out immediately that uh, the Human Microbiome Project is led by uh, multiple institutes. I think there's four of us, four institutes in particular that have the lead, but many other institutes involved. And I'm speaking on behalf of what it could have been uh, several different institute directors who could easily represent um, a, a sort of an update, if you will, about uh, the state of the Human Microbiome Project at NIH. So shown here are the locations of the six initiatives and the numerous researchers involved in the first phase of the Human Microbiome Project called HMP1. Uh, this includes clinical lab sequencing centers, data analysis and coordination center, and these groups together coordinated two types of cohort studies. It also includes the computational tools and ELSI program. Um, these groups contributed tools and expertise in the design as well as the analysis of uh, the HMP1 data. And also shown are technology development projects focused on new ways to analyze the thousands of previously uncultured microbial species uh, that make up the human microbiome. Now, HMP1 is a community resource project. Uh, the goal of HMP1 was to survey the microbiome in humans through two kinds of analyses. First, taxonomic analysis of microbial communities uh, living in and on the human body. And two, analysis of the collective genetic potential of these genomes through metagenomic analyses. Now, the generated uh, community resources included a catalog of reference bacterial genomes and a repository of their cultures, taxonomic and metagenomic data, and clinical and phenotypic data from the cohort studies. Uh, nucleic acid extracts from the healthy cohort study are also available. And future resources may include genome sequences of the individuals, the human subjects participating in these cohort studies, as well as cell lines that derive from these individuals. In total, there were six initiatives in HMP1. All of the 400-plus member consortium interacted through a data, and analysis, a data analysis and coordination center. The survey in HMP1 was conducted in two kinds of cohort studies. First, shown here, a study of 300 healthy um, adult men and women, and then second, a group of 11 demonstration projects which set out to evaluate the microbiomes associated with particular diseases. And many people contributed to the development of this extraordinary research consortium who interacted around the central activities of sample collection um, and ultimately data analysis, and, uh, and, and doing it in a highly choreographed way as illustrated on uh, this particular graphic. Now, the HMP um, Healthy Cohort Study is the most extensive analysis of the microbiome in healthy adults conducted anywhere in the world to date. Five major body sites were studied in HMP1, nasal and oral cavities, the skin, gastrointestinal tract, and the female ural genital tract. An extensive list of inclusion and exclusion criteria, along with clinical verification that these subjects were free of disease at all body sites set the bar for collecting the least disturbed microbiomes possible from these subjects. Also, no other study even today has simultaneously sampled and analyzed the microbiomes of multiple regions of the human body. Now, as shown here on this graphic, each region of the body was home to a unique community of microorganisms. Upon reflection, this probably isn't terribly surprising uh, when you consider the different environmental conditions, whether it's oxygen level, pH, et cetera, as, and in particular nutrients um, such as organic acids, proteins, and so forth that would be um, found at each of these sites that would promote the growth of different microbes capable of taking advantage of the unique habitat. And um, surprisingly, perhaps, the composition of the microbiomes of these healthy adults did not cluster by typical human uh, factors we think that are important, such as gender, age, weight, ethnicity, and race. Now, compared to other metagenomics projects, HMP1 generated the world's largest sequence data set. The graph shown here plots the total number of terabases of DNA sequence deposited in public repositories since the practice of shotgun sequencing for metagenomics projects began in 2006. And there are three sources of microbiome data plotted on this graph, reflecting data from, for human, animals, and the environment in red, black, and green, respectively. 
Note that HMP1 generated about seven terabases of whole genome shotgun sequence data that's not shown here, but after removal of the human sequence, 3.5 terabases, which is what's reflected here, of microbial metagenomic sequence data is left, considerably larger than any other project to date. Now, analysis of the HMP1 metagenomic data suggests that in the United States, each um, individual may support something on the order of 1,000 species of bacteria, but there may be a global pool of upwards of 10,000 microbial species shared among healthy adults. These 10,000 microbial species may contribute to a global pool of something on the order of 8 million unique microbial genes comprising the total genetic potential of the microbiome in humans. Well, needless to say, and as Francis started to highlight, analysis of the rich data set from the Healthy Cohort Study involved extensive work by HMP consortium members whose efforts culminated in many papers, but in particular in this set of key papers in 2012. Two HMP flagship papers were published in Nature in June of 2012, just a little over a year ago, and a set of 20-plus companion papers, reports from individual projects that comprise different data sets as well as on the development of computational methods, underlying analysis approaches, were simultaneously um, published in PLOS in an HMP collection of papers um, that's highlighted here. Well, HMP was established to serve as a catalyst for the human microbiome field more broadly, and it's made a major impact on the field in numerous ways. One measure of this impact comes from, in terms of the numbers of HMP1 publications and their citation frequency. And so shown here is a graph of the total number of HMP1-funded publications in PubMed each year, and that's the blue line, and the average number of times each paper has been cited, and that's the red bars, with the citation frequency calculated from Google Scholar data. The rate of publishing HMP1 papers has increased at an impressive rate. As you can see, with the grand total now being about 350 um, as of May of this year. And as you can also see from the red bars, um, in particular, HMP1 publications are clearly being well cited. Um, another measure of success, one might um, say, is the impact of HMP1 program in terms of the remarkable amount of media attention um, that, that the field is receiving through the efforts of this consortium, uh, both the lay uh, media but also the scientific media. Uh, now, many types of media have shown interest in HMP1, including print, radio, TV, both interviews as well as documentary length pieces. Um, this is just data that has come in to the NHGRI, uh, the institute I direct, our communication office alone, received a total of 70 media inquiries about HMP1 from 2007 to 2012, as shown here, with blue being domestic inquiries and red being foreign inquiries. The number of media inquiries steadily increased with time and peaked over 30 um, in 2012, the year the HMP1 flagship papers came out. And many were multiple inquiries from these sources showing sustained interest from media outlets in the field of microbiome research in general. But of course, let me emphasize, this, does only, this only reflects what came into our communications office um, at one NIH institute. Needless to say, um, I'm quite certain these numbers would be higher if we were able to tally all the media inquiries coming in um, at the other individual institutes that are involved in microbiome research as well, and those also involved in HMP1. Well, recall that HMP1 focused on mapping the human microbiome, but a question immediately arose from these analyses. If there's a global pool of 8 million microbial genes in the human microbiome, what are those genes and those gene products doing? And certainly an analysis of the biological activity of all 8 million genes would be a nearly impossible undertaking. Um, we would need to measure the gene expression and proteins coded from all of these genes and figure out what they're doing. And trying to understand all of the metabolic intermediates and byproducts in human metabolism hasn't been completely done yet. How can we possibly do this when in orders of magnitude more metabolites produced by the microbiome? Well, these questions are what gave rise to HMP2, which will take place from 2013 to 2015. And HMP2, um, which is a common fund, a continuation of a common fund effort, is focused on a more manageable objective generate a data set of microbiome and relevant host genomic and biological properties from a well-characterized cohort of a specific microbiome-associated disease, produce those data as a community resource, and then ensure that the data sets can be queried by the larger research community. 
Though by no means complete, this program will create the first such resource of multiple properties of the microbiome in the context of a known disease. This resource will help the scientific community wrangle with the almost overwhelming numbers of features of the microbiome into a manageable subset of features in order to be able to evaluate which properties or combinations of properties appear to be the most informative for deciphering the role of the microbiome in human health and disease. Well, HMP1 will start this fiscal year, and we plan to support two awards for a total investment of the NIH Common Fund of $5 million per year. And of course, this is in addition to whatever will be going on in microbiome research at the individual institutes. And you can see from Francis's presentation, the number of institutes indeed funding microbiome research is growing at a steady pace. And finally, and just to close, uh, for more information about HMP1, including historical information and HMP2 as it um, um, begins to get traction, as well as all of their resources, publications, and news um, is always going to be available on the NIH Common web page dedicated um, to the Human Microbiome Project, the URL given here. So let me just close by saying that on behalf of the collective NIH leadership, I want to congratulate those of you who have participated in HMP1 all of those researchers and their remarkable accomplishments and contributions to the field, really catapulting the field forward, as Francis uh, alluded to as well. And we really look forward to similar successes for HMP2. These efforts truly um, have catalyzed the field of microbiome research in a very productive way, and um, all of you should be very uh, gratified to know that your contributions have been very important for those advances. So thank you very much for your time, and with that, um, um, as a context, uh, I think it's very exciting to now start to hear the science in greater detail in subsequent talks. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we're going to... Uh, thank our two speakers one more time. <laughs> and uh, now it's time to uh, begin our next, our first session. So, Melody. Hi. It's my privilege to introduce our keynote speaker today, Dr. David Relman, a physician scientist who's a professor of medicine and of microbiology and immunology at Stanford University. He studies the indigenous microbiota in human and marine mammals. Um, he's provided insight into the oral gut and female reproductive tract microbiota. Basically, he's a one of the pioneers in the field to which this meeting is devoted. He's also pursued studies on pathogen discovery, host pathogen interactions, and mechanisms of diseases and conditions such as dengue fever, fevers of unknown origin, and preterm birth. Um, he has served on numerous panels, committees related to microbial threats and biosecurity. He's the recipient of numerous awards, such as an NIH Director's Pioneer Award and the Infectious Diseases Society of America Squib Award, um, just to mention a few. Um, he's a member of the National Academy of Sciences, and he's served as the president of um, the Infectious Diseases Society of America 2012 to 2013. And last but not least, anecdotally, his um, good citizenship extends to the community in which he lives. He's the chief medical officer for the Haight-Ashbury Medical Centers. So please join me in welcoming Dr. David Relman. <laughs> 